I previously ranked hematopoietic stem cell transplant as likely the most effective treatment in multiple sclerosis. And today, I'm going to talk about a book I recently read by the man who performed the first HSCT procedure for MS in the United States and the second in the world, Dr. Richard Burt, who developed many of the advances in HSCT for MS and other autoimmune diseases, and his recently published book, Everyday Miracles, Curing Multiple Sclerosis, Sclerosis, Neuroderma and autoimmune diseases by hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and he talks about how he became interested in this treatment for autoimmune diseases and dedicated his career to it, improved the treatment over time, and he tells stories about his successes and failures, and I'll talk a little bit about my own critiques from the perspective of a neurologist and why hematopoietic stem cell transplant is not more popular amongst neurologists, and a little bit about why it's difficult to get it covered by insurance companies. And next week, I'll publish a video with an interview of the author himself, Dr. Burt, and we'll ask some additional questions and learn where do we go from here now that he has retired. So I'm going to go ahead and summarize the book, and I'll start off with his childhood. He talks about how in the third grade, he actually had a classmate who died of leukemia, and he always remembered that, and he's not exactly sure if that inspired him to pursue a career career in medicine or hematology oncology, but he later became a hematologist and was doing a fellowship in hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And early in his career, he planned to use this treatment to treat cancer. So for those who aren't familiar with this treatment, chemotherapy drugs are given which wipe out the immune system and then a bone marrow transplant or hematopoietic stem cell transplant is given to replenish the immune system. Now one thing I will give Dr. Burt a ton of credit for is that he states in the book very clearly that this is not a stem cell treatment. The real treatment is the drugs, the chemotherapy drugs which wipe out the immune system. And the stem cells are really to help regenerate the immune system and the red blood cells to help people recover faster and reduce the risks of anemia and infection. Now, as he explains very clearly in the book, there are different types of hematopoietic stem cell transplants, myeloablative and non-myeloablative. Myeloablative hematopoietic stem cell transplants use stronger, more toxic drugs, such as busulfan or BEAM or total body radiation. And without giving the transplant, the patient will actually die. It's actually 100% necessary to give the transplant. However, with non-myeloablative cell transplant, you still retain some of your immune system and the immune system will eventually regenerate and it may take time and there's a significant risk of infections in the interim, but it's not absolutely necessary to give the transplant and it's believed that the treatment efficacy would be exactly the same. So again, the stem cell transplant has nothing to do with the treatment effect. And as we'll discuss, he favors non-myeloablative treatments or non-myeloablative hematopoietic stem cell transplant to treat autoimmune diseases in general. So he was doing his fellowship in hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And one thing that he noticed is that people who underwent this treatment for leukemia, they had to redo all their childhood vaccinations because they lost all of their memory lymphocytes. So they didn't have immunity to shingles or whooping cough. And they had to do the entire vaccination series over again. And so he realized, well, the memory B and T cells must be gone. And these cells are also the cells responsible for driving inflammation in various autoimmune diseases. Now, the book talks a lot about multiple sclerosis, which is, of course, what I'll focus on in this video. But he also talks about other autoimmune diseases, such as systemic sclerosis or scleroderma, neuromyelitis optica, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, and Crohn's disease. And he has chapters on those diseases as well. But we'll stick to multiple sclerosis for the time being. Now, it's very interesting that he thought of this because generally speaking, hematologists are not particularly interested in autoimmune diseases except for autoimmune diseases of the hematologic cells, such as aplastic anemia, which is an autoimmune disease causing low red blood cells, or ITP, idiopathic thrombocytic 
purpura and autoimmune disease causing low platelets. So he did have some familiar with autoimmune disease. But anyways, he decided he wanted to pursue this. And he was criticized by some of his colleagues saying, hey, we're here to treat cancer. We're here to save lives. Why would you waste your career treating autoimmune disease? But he was interested in it. He wanted to pursue something different. He thought that there was something untapped here. And indeed, people had performed hematopoietic stem cell transplant for autoimmune disease, but he was the first to do it for multiple sclerosis in the United States. And I think the most interesting thing about the book is how he developed and refined his treatment over time. So he started out with an animal study, which was published in 1995, and he first performed hematopoietic stem cell transplant in experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, a mouse model of MS. And interestingly, in the book, he writes that he had great moral qualms about doing this sort of animal research because he's, you know, sort of an animal rights activist and he has questions about this research, but he saw it as the only way to advance the technique. You have to test the dosing, you have to have a proof of concept before actually doing it in humans, but he did it, it he published it, and it was in fact effective. Later on, he did his first studies in humans, but because this was considered a very aggressive treatment, remember back in the day, some of these aggressive myeloablative regimens had very high mortality rates of around 5%. So the idea is you can't really do it on a young, healthy person. It's just too risky. You could do it only on someone who's desperate, someone with very aggressive MS. And so he started doing the procedures on people with progressive multiple sclerosis with advanced disability. Now, the way he wrote the book is he tells stories of some of his patients, and I think he changed some details to maintain their privacy just to bring their similitude to the text. And he really did a good job explaining how things changed over time because unfortunately these early treatments were not successful. And he actually started out with a very aggressive regimen using total body radiation and unfortunately, his patients didn't get better, and in fact, they tended to continue to progress despite the treatment. He later decided that using total body radiation was too risky because of the potential risk of future cancer, particularly in younger people with multiple sclerosis. But he later was able to start treating people with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. And in this view, this was the big change because he started getting great results. So his first patient named James was treated with a total body irradiation regimen of hematopoietic stem cell transplant and had a dramatic reversal of both physical and cognitive disability. And he was able to follow up with James 21 years later, and he had never been treated with any other disease modifying therapy and he was stable and relapse free and doing well during that entire time and he was in quite poor shape when he came to Dr. Burt. Now, as I said, he later changed course. He was publishing his results. He had a lot of trouble getting published in neurology journals at first, just because neurologists weren't too interested in this treatment. So he was publishing them in hematology journals, but hematologists weren't all that interested in using this treatment to treat autoimmune disease. So he was sort of a little bit of an orphan. He was sort of in between specialties but he kept doing his work and eventually he was able to do some randomized trials that were published in prominent neurology journals and he started to gain more acceptance. Now at the same time he changed his treatment approach and he started using a regimen of two drugs, cytoxan or cyclophosphamide and alimtuzumab, which at the time was Campath H, but is now an FDA approved drug, Limtrata. So cytoxan is a drug which is destructive to all lymphocytes B and T cells. It can cause some specific side effects such as hair loss, and it can also cause inflammation of the bladder and blood in the urine, known as hemorrhagic cystitis. And there's also a small risk of future bladder cancer and future hematologic cancer, and it can also cause infertility. So this drug is no joke. Limtrata is an anti-CD52 monoclonal antibody that targets only the lymphocytes, the B and T cells, and it has a risk of infusion reactions, infections, but also as the B lymphocytes come back without T cell regulation, there's a risk of secondary autoimmune disease. And one of the problems that he was coming across is that a small number of people were getting ITP, the hematologic condition I mentioned earlier, 
idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, basically where you develop antibodies against your platelets, you develop low platelets, you can't form blood clots, and then you could have bleeding events. But he was doing this with relatively good clinical success, and he describes several stories of people getting this improving and having long-term remission. And so there's this trend to stronger myeloablative regimens to non-myeloablative regimens, people recovering faster, but having you know lower risk of side effects and still having, generally speaking, high probability of long-term remission. Because of the effect of ITP, he changed to a different regimen where he would give the cytoxin plus something called ATG, which is anti-thymocyte globulin. This is a drug not normally used by neurologists. So both cyclophosphamide and Lemtrada are drugs that I'm very familiar with. But there's a little bit of a difference. So the dose of cytoxin that I use, and by the way, I just had a patient earlier today with a different autoimmune disease of the nervous system whom I'm giving cytoxin to, but I use doses like cytoxin one gram per meter squared monthly for six months. And usually I wouldn't give a dose higher than two grams, so I'm using a total dose of something like 12 grams. But he would use doses like 200 milligrams per kilogram. So imagine if you weigh 80 kilograms, this is a pretty huge amount to give someone at once. So much, much higher doses that are much more toxic, and they can cause things like neutropenic fever, having fever with very low levels of neutrophils, a certain type of white blood cells, and that can be risky and cause a high rate of infection. So there was still some amount of serious morbidity and mortality with this. Now, initially, he reported the risk of ITP, again, the low platelet disorder, with cytoxin and Lemtrada was 12%, which is pretty high. But when he switched to cytoxin plus ATG, antithymocyte globulin, it was only 2%. And then he further changed the regimen where he would, in addition to the ATG, give IVIG or intravenous immunoglobins, which is one of the treatments of ITP. Or he would give cytoxin plus rituximab or cytoxin plus ATG plus rituximab. So it's interesting that the regimen of cytoxin and Lemtrada and cytoxin and rituximab are regimens that neurologists are actually very, very familiar with and prescribe all the time. They just don't use those very high doses. He also notes that there was actually a study by neurologists at Johns Hopkins where they used transplant doses of cytoxin, 200 milligrams per kilogram, but they did not give ATG. TG, and they found that it was not as effective. They didn't really produce these long-term remissions, at least not in as many cases. So Dr. Burt's view is you have to give cyclophosphamide plus the ATG or at least some other drug such as rituximab or Lemtrada. Cyclophosphamide on its own may not be successful. So he tells various stories of some of his patients with dramatic results, though he notes that he didn't have success in progressive MS, and he didn't necessarily have as much success in people with greater amounts of disability. But in younger people with relapsing MS, particularly those who had recent relapses causing a lot of disability, he had numerous patients have dramatic improvement and long-term remission and did not need to take further disease-modifying therapies, although he does note, according According to some studies, if you follow people out for a very prolonged period of time, some people do have relapses, but maybe only around 20%, and they're not necessarily severe. Now, this is not unique to hematopoietic stem cell transplant. There are people who have multiple sclerosis and they get cancer, such as breast cancer, and they get multi-drug chemotherapy to treat the cancer, and they go into long-term remission. People getting certain types of multiple sclerosis disease-modifying therapies, such as Lemtrada, or cladribine don't necessarily need long-term treatment. They may need only a few years of treatment, and then later on they could only treat as needed. And there's some people who took Lemtrada many years ago and haven't been treated since and are still stable. Same thing is true with cladribine, though it's not as successful, at least based on observational studies, 
as hematopoietic stem cell transplant with cytoxan and ATG. Now, one thing he doesn't talk about in his book, which I'll ask him next week, is there's one observational study in Italy that suggests that people getting an even stronger regimen, BEAM, may do better in the long run than just getting cytoxan plus ATG. So there's a sort of trade-off between toxicity and long-term benefit of the treatment. Now, he goes on to talk about what is hematopoietic stem cell transplant like today. He says that in people with relapsing or remitting MS, the mortality rate is much lower than it used to be, perhaps only 0.2%, with the right patient selection. He emphasizes not everyone is a good candidate for this treatment. He does note two instances where people did relapse and he had to perform a second transplant many years later, but he feels that the second treatment was successful. He also talks a little bit about the cost of hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Of course, it is quite expensive. He estimates it's around $100,000 for the procedure. Of course, it could be a little bit more if people have other problems such as infection requiring hospitalization or other problems later on such as infertility requiring additional treatments. But if you think about it, that's not necessarily that much considering many standard disease modifying therapies with high efficacy like Ocrevus or even low efficacy disease modifying therapies such as Avonex could be almost as expensive, maybe on the order of sixty dollars to $80,000 a year and require long-term treatment. So overall, HSCT may actually save money. And he actually goes on a, a side rant at the end of the book where he talks about this is essentially a pervasive issue where pharmaceutical companies have an incentive to develop drugs that will make them maximum profit. And one example is, of course, rituximab versus Ocrevus. Rituximab, a B-cell depleting agent, which in fact he uses as part of HSCT sometimes, has been used in MS since the early 2000s. There are multiple successful studies with rituximab, most famously at the University of California, San Francisco, such as the Hermes trial and relapsing remitting MS, and also the Olympus trial in primary progressive MS. And yet, the same drug company that owned rituximab, Genzyme, decided to develop a new product, Ocrevus, which is very similar, also a B-cell depleter. And Dr. Burt says, hey, there's really no evidence that one is better than the other. Why should we use this new shiny drug? He thinks essentially the same thing is true with hematopoietic stem cell transplant because these are old drugs that are off patent. No pharmaceutical company has the incentive to promote them, and so they may be very underutilized. And and in general, he talks about why this is an underutilized treatment in his opinion. One is that neurologists are just not very familiar with hematopoietic stem cell transplant. I have to admit, I'm not very familiar with the technicalities of this treatment. But he says hematologists are not very familiar with autoimmune disease. Dr. Burt is one of a kind. Most hematologists know almost nothing about multiple sclerosis. Of course, he knows more than most only because he's been working with people with the disease for many years. He didn't start off knowing a lot about MS. And again, there's no patentable product and no economic incentive. And Dr. Burt probably didn't make a lot of money doing this. He was an academic hematologist, paid on salary his entire career. He wasn't running a private practice monetizing this treatment. And so that's just the way it is. And he may be right that it's somewhat underutilized. But I would be remiss if I didn't offer at least a few critiques of the book as well. And that doesn't mean this is a bad book. It's a very good book. I really enjoyed it, particularly the fascinating early development of HSCT. And I'll include an Amazon link in the links below. But I do have a little bit of a different perspective as a neurologist. I do have to give Dr. Burt a ton of credit for being so innovative and ambitious and taking a huge risk with his career. Again, he didn't necessarily significantly financially benefit from this, and he's really avoided the spotlight in general and stayed off of social media despite becoming more famous over the years. And really just being persistent in the face of possible defeat with his early failures with progressive MS. But we do have a little bit of a different perspective. Now, as a neurologist, I could be somewhat biased in the 
patients that I'm seeing. For instance, there may be someone who had hematopoietic stem cell transplant who did very well, and they just decided they didn't want to follow up with a neurologist anymore, so I'm not seeing those individuals. The same thing could be true for people who are pursuing naturalistic therapies such as diet or supplements or functional medicine and are just really not interested in seeing a neurologist. So I'm not necessarily seeing every person with a diagnosis of MS, so my perspective is not full. But the same, of course, is true with Dr. Burt. In his book, he sometimes makes it seem like multiple sclerosis is a universally very aggressive and bad disease, but I think he would be surprised how many people I see with relatively mild MS. Now, when I say mild, that doesn't mean they have no symptoms whatsoever, but they may have a history of MS for 20 years and be 50 years old and look very good with no noticeable symptoms and be working full time and having a great life and being stable. And this is sometimes with standard disease modifying therapies, or even in some cases with no disease modifying therapies. There are some people with so-called benign MS where it's just simply not that aggressive. Also, I really do think highly effective disease modifying therapies has changed the game a lot. I remember early in my career, and I know I don't look that old, a lot of young people with relapsing MS were having bad relapses where we were admitting to them to the hospital for solumedrol or plasmapheresis. And a lot of people had significant disability early on in the disease. And I do think we've caught, cut down on that a significant amount. People tend to be more stable we have actually documented and published data within Kaiser Permanente Southern California Medical Group that our rate of hospitalizations amongst people with multiple sclerosis is dis decreasing. And this is despite the fact that we were giving some people immunosuppressants, which can increase the risk of certain infections. So we really have changed the game. And there are numerous publications suggesting that at least on the average, multiple sclerosis has become more benign over time with people reaching certain disability levels such as EDSS4 or six at later and later ages and more and more time with the disease. This is a gradual process, but over many decades, it's quite significant. Now, he tells a lot of his stories in his books of people taking high efficacy therapies like Tysabri or Lemtrada or Ocrevus who are still having bad relapses. And while yes, this does occur, it's quite rare. Most people taking these types of drugs are stable. That doesn't mean they don't have any symptoms, some residual disability from prior attacks. And certainly there are people taking these drugs who do go on to develop progressive multiple sclerosis, but they're pretty good at preventing relapses and new MRI lesions. It's just that the people who aren't doing well on standard treatments are the ones who seek out hematopoietic stem cell transplants. So it's a little bit of a biased sample. I think overall, multiple sclerosis is not as severe as he believes, at least on the average. Another critique is he draws this distinction between relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis and secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And he essentially says that progressive MS is you know, a degenerative disease and like other progressive degenerative neurological diseases, Lou Gehrig's disease, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, the treatment is not great and we cannot necessarily prevent the progression of the disease, which is definitely true to some extent. Younger people with relapsing MS they tend to have more inflammatory lesions and a greater potential for reversal of disability. But I don't agree that it's such a sharp cutoff. Some people with relapsing MS can acquire disability that is irreversible. Even if you can halt the disease, they don't necessarily get everything back. And that's unfortunately true for some people with relapsing MS. And some people with progressive MS actually do have reversal of disability. And I do have some patients with a pretty significant improvement despite a diagnosis of progressive MS. And of course, some people with progressive MS do make active lesions and do have relapses. And there's increasing evidence that disease modifying therapy can be beneficial even in people with progressive MS, such as there's data, for instance, with Ocrevus that it can decrease the probability of people needing a cane, even those who have progressive MS. This is from the Oratorio study, just as one example. The benefits 
might be more modest, not as dramatic as in relapsing MS, but they may still be there, at least for some people with progressive MS, not for everyone with progressive MS. And it's just not practically achievable that we can completely reverse all of disability in everyone with relapsing MS, uh, though certainly I don't dispute that he's had very good results. Um, you know, some of the other things that I would mention is he talks about how there's this distinction between hematopoietic stem cell transplant and disease modifying therapy, and that many people improve getting hematopoietic stem cell transplant, whereas the best that can be hoped for with disease modifying therapy is stability or slowing the progression. But that's not exactly true. CDI or confirmed disability improvement, which means someone has an improvement of their EDSS score or their measure of disability, and even after three or six months, it stays improved, that is now a marker in modern clinical trials. And in fact, even in his publication, the MIST study, M-I-S-T, comparing hematopoietic stem cell transplant to other disease-modifying therapies, he does report that with certain disease-modifying therapies, there are a significant number of people who improve, such as with Lemtrada. Of course, that must be the case because Cytoxan, Rituximab, Lemtrada, these are disease-modifying therapies that are actually used by neurologists. Of course, at different doses, it's not exactly the same as what he does, but there isn't such a sharp distinction between hematopoietic stem cell transplant and disease-modifying therapy. HSCT is a very aggressive, very potent, likely the most effective disease-modifying therapy in existence. And I have, in fact, had patients with great results with HSCT, some treated by Dr. Burt or in other places, such as Clinica Ruiz in Mexico, receiving various regimens, various conditioning regimens with different medications, and many have done quite well and have been stable. And of course, it is my recommendation not to give disease-modifying therapies unless there's evidence of new disease activity in the form of relapses or new MRI lesions to people who have received this type of treatment regardless of the specific conditioning regimen, because even with the more conservative regimens, the possibility of long-term remission is fairly good. That being said, I've seen some people who have had HSCT who have not had great results. Perhaps they've been stable, but they haven't had any improvement. And I have had some people, there's one person in particular, uh, James Bott, chapter four of my book, Resilience in the Face of Multiple Sclerosis. You, if you want to read it, you can get it for free on Amazon. He had HSCT and he seemed to be a good candidate, young person with relapsing MS, but he didn't do particularly well. But that's just one person. Overall, I think the results are fairly good. So I'd be interested to know what you think. Have you had hematopoietic stem cell transplant? Would you consider this treatment? If you have had it, what are you? your results. And if you did read this book, what do you think? And again, check out this book in the Amazon link below and stay tuned for the interview next week.